Hi, friend. Welcome to the Olive Branch Mom Podcast. My name is Bridget Adler, a Catholic mom of four turned religion teacher. Each week, you'll hear interviews, tips, and strategies to grow in faith and find peace in the chaos, while we extend the proverbial olive branch from one spiritual viewpoint to another. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let's jump right into it. So we can get into meditations before mass. Yes, we can. I have my notes. So the first chapter is about stillness. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. (laughs) Imagine that. This is where, imagine that most of the parts I underlined just because there was so much stuff in here. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Like you're speaking my language. What about you? Oh yeah. I mean, every one of these chapters is just so rich with so many things to talk about. Yeah. It was very profound. Um, I just love this quote. How are we possibly to hear what God is saying? That we listen all is something not everyone does. It is even better when we pay attention and make a real effort to understand what is being said. And I think this is, um, there's so much emphasis, especially when I was sort of in church and into the evangelical world, there's lots of emphasis on like praying, but there's just not a ton on listening, which is why I love the book because it's all about listening. <laughs> like it's all about listening. Right. So about it. It's very like, how do you prepare yourself? Right. Like, In what ways can you cleanse out and pull away from the material world a little bit? And um, I just, it was also funny too, you know, how he talks about like, he's like, even when there's silence in church, someone's clearing their throat or shuffling a paper, or I thought that was really fun. I'm like, yes, I, yes, I've been in, you know what I mean? Like you Mm -hmm. a Christmas pageant where it's quiet and someone's like, (laughs) this is like, they're uncomfortable with the quiet. So they're interjecting whatever noise Correct. that they can at this point. And I don't know if it's a conscious thing. I think some of this is so subconscious and just like so deeply embedded in our discomfort and stillness. Um, I agree. I'll just speak for myself, right? It's like, it's even like allowing there to be a lapse in the conversation is can be unsettling, right? Well, I mean, he calls it out here by saying, you know, if there's a, a pause in the middle of something, public function or speech, speech, lecture, whatever, someone always promptly coughs or clears his throat because he's experiencing the stillness as a breach in the unwinding road of speech and sound, which he attempts to fill with something, anything, mm. because mm. for him, the stillness is like a void, giving a sense of disorder and discomfort, but really you know, part of the um, point of this chapter is talking about stillness, not in a negative way of taking something away, but in adding to something, this tranquility, this attentiveness, being receptive and alert and ready. There's nothing, and he says, there's nothing inert or or oppressive about it. My other favorite, um, truth can be recognized only from silence the constant talker will never or at least rarely grasp truth oh that hurts <laughs> ouch that's <laughs> <laughs> oh, so profound i love i love something the other thing i like is he uses this concept of the clean swept room and we've talked about i think some of my frustration with some practices and i'm like you know why can't this just be part of who we are. Why do we have to like learn the practice of stillness or like learn a practice of sort of like preparing ourselves? Like why, why aren't we just born innately to know how to do this? And I love the concept of a cleanly swept room because it's like, you know, if you sweep your room, you don't assume that it's going to stay clean. Do you? No, of course not. Just, I, I dropped a whole thing of water on the floor. To the day. Like, you know what I mean? Like life happens and it's going to get dirty again. So it's like, the concept of constantly like sweeping yourself internally to ground out all the nonsense. That's not you. You know what I mean? I've cleared all out. So you really can receive. I love that metaphor that he uses here. Well, I I know a lot of um, saints and, you know, mystics and just people that are thinking about their inner room as like analogous to a way of, it's like your soul, a way of envisioning an imagery of your soul is this inner room that you go to. So thinking about your inner room being clean, swept and having to be continually maintained and swept and clean, because again, we don't expect your kitchen to stay clean (laughs) without sleeping it, right? You know, there's an expectation that you have to maintain it, which I like. And I, I, 
And even though this is, again, it's meditations before mass, I think I take the metaphor sort of more broadly than this too. And I think, you know, so like, for example, right now I'm having like a lull at work. It's just not a lot going on. Like we're moving into the summer months. People are going to start taking vacation. Like things normally slow down and you would not believe the level of anxiety. This is bringing up in me. Mm -hmm. I think I'm similar to many people, especially now in a COVID world where a lot of us are from home that we are constantly linked to devices that are telling us what to do at all times, right? Whether that be a meeting pop-up, whether that be like an email that's coming in and just having to be sort of forced to reckon with the feeling of things slowing down. Just to me, my, it felt like an inordinate reaction. I was having to this thing and I'm like, wow, I guess I'm not as far as I thought in this journey where even that is just so upsetting. And it's like, well, what a perfect opportunity to work on stillness than one that is being presented to me. But yet I think our culture, because we are so efficiency focused, it feels like you're being lazy. It feels like you're not being efficient. It feels like you're not being productive. And we've been taught to understand that if something is not productive, that it is a waste of time. And I think what this chapter is sort of inviting is like, no, no, this is like the sacred realm. (laughs) Like it's like stillness really is that sacred realm where if you can live in it and be comfortable with it, like you can, I feel like it's one of those, like everything is fine. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like you just gotta be linked to the present moment through stillness. Well, and he calls out the, the very importance of it by saying on page six, If someone were to ask me what the liturgical life begins with, I should answer with learning stillness. Without Mm. it, everything remains superficial and vain. It's a prerequisite of the liturgical holy act. Yes. So he challenges us to, instead of, if you're going to church services, instead of thumbing through the bulletin or looking at your prayer book or checking out whatever else is in the pew or just looking around or chit-chatting with your family, is just to take a moment to still yourself and turn inwardly to quiet your soul and have that moment of composing yourself to participate in something through alertness. And instead of thinking about it as like, what I'm taking, I need to be quiet and take away my thoughts, like this taking away or void, you know, that he was mentioning. Um, Instead, you're thinking about adding to the moment, this moment of stillness with your participation and actively calming yourself and centering yourself. It's kind of like in um, the atrium of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we call it making silence. Uh, because when you speak to the children, okay, everybody be quiet. That's, that's different than making silence. You are an making active silence. participant in making silence. So then we have the children put like their hand on their heart and close their eyes and breathe in slowly and breathe out slowly. And we'll see how long we can make silence together. You know, it's an that. active participatory fullness instead of like, let's like take away the noise. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I like, what I love about that is that you're teaching children, which is important because if you are an adult and you've never learned this, it's not hard to sort of like, un like, defragment yourself and sort of figure it out. So I think that's great. The other thing I like about that is you're not, you're saying creating. So I think the misconception that I see a lot is like, well, I need to turn everything off. And that's really hard. Like try to tell yourself not to think about something. It's extremely difficult. But if you're just saying like, just still let it run, let it run through. You know what I mean? Like don't, and becoming less of a barrier and more like with the water going with the flow, like just let it flow through you. You can create a sense of stillness around you while still having whatever thought pop, like whatever it's like email, your brain is like, there's, there's tons of stuff coming in at all times. And he says in here, and I quote, um, we are constantly bombarded by images and sounds that overstimulate our eyes and ears and draw our hearts away from God. I think what he's saying about that is, the constant distraction of those images can be something we can think that those in fact is life and it's not. It is a mental perception of things that are coming in, but it's like mental spam. It's not significant. You know what I mean? It means nothing. It's not life. It's not stillness, right? So I think that's what I like about the creating stillness is because you're not focusing on stopping anything. You're just focusing on 
creating something within you and maybe paying less attention to noise. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, he speaks about, I think you're you're hitting on what he's talking about in terms of attentiveness, because we are being bombarded with so much, but we need to choose what we're going to pay attention to. Yeah. What we're going to edit out and what we're going to tailor. Yes. And attentiveness, he says, is the clue to the stillness in question stillness before God. So attentiveness that ties into, um, what a future chapter is going to discuss about, um, composure too, which I love that as a concept. So that's going to be a good chapter to discuss because I think there's a a definite lack of composure or the importance of being composed. Yeah. Poised, ready, I mean, we're rushing from one thing to another and we're also asking our children to do the same thing, but by yes. their very nature, they're trying to slow us down at all yes. times so they can compose themselves. Yeah. But we're past the point of realizing the importance of it. We've lost some of us as adults out of necessity or we think necessity. We think necessity. We have erased that concept. You know, you don't need that. You just need to go. You just yeah. need to move. You need to act. Yeah. You don't need to take time to compose your, your heart, your soul, your mind. No, well, there is some pushback to it now. I think people are starting to see because of what I would think is basically a mental health crisis since COVID began, you know, people are really addressing their anxiety in different ways and seeing the importance of taking this time to reflect on their well being, their quote unquote self care, if you will. But you know, true self-care is addressing your heart and your soul and your, you know, your inner, keeping your inner room clean slept. It's not about, you know, making sure you do your exercise regimen a certain way or making sure you no know, eating no carbs or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's deep and fundamental, you know, not small different changes or those are just like band-aids basically. I think you're really hitting on something that is not discussed. And I think the reason it is not is because as you mentioned, I feel like we've lost the thread a little bit in terms of understanding what is going to bring us comfort. Um, and I really see what you're saying. And and I, I fall into this too, like, Oh, say I have like a migraine or a bad day. I'm like, well, what did I do like what routine did I miss? Did I not do my stretching? Did I not do my yoga? And it's like, it's like, we're focusing on the absolute wrong things. It's not an act of doing. It's a sense of, it's a sense of wholeness that we have within ourselves. And sorry if that sounds too woo woo, but it's like, I can't think of any other way to say it. of just like checking in with the self and being like, what is going on? Right. Instead of focusing on like, although, you know, as we both joke, there's that meme about, you know, Moses being like, I'm done. I want to die. And God's like, why don't you like take a nap or was it Abraham? I <laughs> take a nap and eat something. Right. So like there are moments where there are moments where you just need a rest and to eat, of course, but all that you notice both those things have to do with listening to your body. And as we're learning from meditations from through mass, if you are not still, you cannot listen. If you are not still with your body, how can you hope to interpret the signs that it's giving you for rest, for food, for whatever else? Well, and that migraine for me is always the signal that something has multiple things are going awry at the same time. Correct. It's never just one thing. So mm-hmm. when you sit back and you're like, cause I do the same thing where I'm trying to diagnose it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, it's because this, this, and this. Well, normally yeah. I have those two, but you know, then there was one more thing that tipped me over the edge. So obviously I focus very much on the stillness chapter, but walk us through the next few chapters. Silence and the word is the next chapter. Okay. So let's see. What do I want to say about that? Well, you know, kind of like the onion concept of the varying layers of the word, you know, how it can sink into yourself, how your heart can express itself beyond just the initial words that you're speaking, which is pretty Mm -hmm. interesting, I think. Yes. And I think too, um, for those that might not be religious, I think that there are, there is still, um, great wisdom that you can find in scripture, whether that be this or other holy texts. And there are different, again, you don't, 
I, I want to make this as accessible as possible. I think like an act of sort of preparing yourself and rereading certain lines in a certain way, like Lecto Divina and all that, like there are ways to like really um, deeply immerse yourself. So like chants are like this too, when you have like the Hare Krishna's chanting, like it's a, they're bringing themselves in connection closer with like, you know, that energy, that spirit within all of us and meditating on the word is a one way that's not commonly used in our society now, but like, think of like a poem you really like, or you know what I mean? Something like that. I'm trying to find a way to, to have people link to it because again, I, your point, and I'm thinking again about like, I would call it a modern health crisis, a mental health crisis with COVID, like thinking of ways to sort of get us back in touch with that. This could be one of those ways, right. Of like bringing yourself back to sort of interacting with the wisdom of scripture and sort of like bringing that connection sort of back in alignment. When you think about it, like modern music is poetry. I mean, not everyone feels like poetry is super accessible to them. I think people have very strong opinions when they hear the word poetry or, oh, I got to read a poem, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. (laughs) You know, um, maybe because it's been presented to you too young in your life where, you know, because it's these are things that you learn in the course of learning about our English language and composing um, sentences. I mean, everyone's, I think every single one of my kids has done that one where you have to start um, each line starting with the same, like a certain letter, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Yeah. You're looking for yeah. rhyming and you're experimenting with your words, but to like infuse real meaning that is going to move someone's heart through poetry. I mean, wow. You know, I'm starting to appreci- appreciate it a whole lot more than I used to when I was younger. And I think music can contain really powerful truths and really powerful feelings and emotions um, because they're they're choosing words very sparingly. And I think when you think about like a real well-composed song, and so as interesting on page 10, the author says, only the word that emerges from silence is substantial and powerful. To be effective, it must first find its way into open speech. Although this is not necessary for some truths, those inexpressible depths of comprehension of oneself, of others, and of God. For these, the experienced but unspoken suffices. For all others, however, the interior word must become exterior. Is that interesting? What do you think about that? I think that's very interesting. I don't know what it fully means. And I think um, this is... What I love about this book is we get to the end. I quoted this book at the, there's a, there's a section at the end that I thought was really significant because it kind of captures this. He talks a lot about mystery and how we need to sort of be attuned with and comfortable with the fact that there are mysteries that we might never in quotes know about. And I think for me, that's, this is one of those things where I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about, but it's got, but it intrigues me and I want to know more. What about you? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel that people need to reacquaint themselves with being comfortable with mystery. I mean, we've become very complacent and thinking that science can explain everything Yeah, and that we can just, and I think really it's gotten even more advanced because we're able to like add our fingertips, look up pretty much anything we want to look up (laughs) and get information on pretty much anything that we want to get information on. Yeah. So, you know, then that's led us to not being as comfortable with just wondering and pondering and thinking for ourselves, being okay with not knowing it's like, if somebody brings something up and we look it up right away, like, you know, the definition of a word or the date somebody did this or what celebrity was in what movie? I mean, we're quick yeah. to like just dissolve that mystery right off the bat, right? Yeah, yeah. So this discomfort of not knowing, and I think also the illusion that that information is means something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah. his his point about the word here and words, I think he's really getting at truth, right? And word is a way of getting the truth right out and into your psyche, your realm of understanding. And it also gets it out into the world, right? Which is why we have scripture in the first place. If you think about it, right. It's like, this is a way, um, obviously God doesn't need just this way, but it is a way 
to transmit truth, right? About the reality of our world today. And, you know, a way, it's a way to interact with it, I think. Oh, absolutely. You know, and they're saying, you know, the author says silence opens the inner font from which the word rises. That's very beautiful. So beautiful, right? That's very beautiful. Yeah. But then, you know, calling out on page 11, for example, in the words of the liturgy, the truth of God and of redeemed man is meant to blaze in them, the heart of Christ in whom the father's love lives and the hearts of his followers must find their full expression. Isn't that beautiful? What, yeah. What does that mean to you? I mean, when you think about the Catholic liturgy, there's a lot of words that you hear every single mass. And for people, they tend to, people that are, have been lifelong you know, Catholics or cradle Catholics or whatever, you know, some of it, they're just not paying attention to anymore because yeah. they're going through the motions and other people it's the exact opposite because <laughs> a word is meant to blaze because yeah. in Amazing. them is the heart of Christ and the, in the heart of Christ is where the father's love lives. So our hearts must find our full expression in this act. Okay. In I feel like earth. I, I feel like I'm understanding a little bit more. Okay. So I think in this chapter where he's going, and I think you put your finger on it is if you are not listening, the word can't reach you. Because we all know, like we're sitting around, we're reading something, we're watching something where like there's a music playing and all of a sudden there's like a reaction and you're like, well, I really like the song or oh, this poem was really speaking to me. Like the truth, it, it's like the truth is hitting you. You're like, oh, what is that? Or you feel like a chill or like you get very intrigued. And I think that's what he means. If you are not prepared and you don't have that sort of like perspective on your inner stillness and you are not in the moment and there and listening, it can't reach you and you can't respond to it. Like the heart, your heart cannot respond to it, which is why. And I just think of like the years and years I spent in church pews, completely not even being there, which I think a lot of, <laughs> to be honest, I think a lot of us are in that situation where we're just not aware of the truth that is coming to us, right. By word, by scripture, because we're just in a million other different places, but that's what I, I'm feeling like I'm getting close to understanding a little bit where he's going here. Well, you know, then he also says the heart incapable of storing anything of withdrawing into itself cannot thrive like a Ooh. field that must constantly produce. It is soon impoverished. Oh. And then I was thinking also towards on um, page 12, he talks about the, the importance of silence for the sacred celebration cannot be overstressed. Silence, which prepares for it, as well as the silence that establishes itself again and again during the ceremony. Yeah. So for instance, um, this made me think of when we used to watch mass um, during the quarantine period, we would watch it online. And there's just like the tendency to want to fast forward during all the moments of silence or the moments yes. that weren't the priest speaking or the, the yep. lecturer speaking. Yep. And don't we already do that? Like continually over everything that we watch video we wise, we can't take a moment of silence. We're trying to be super efficient with our viewing, yes. super yes. efficient with everything we're doing. It's like, let's yeah. get to the action, you know? So relishing these moments of silence as like moments of reflection and attention. Yeah. Is super important. And another thing that just has been really eroded by how we're living our lives. Con consistently eroded. And I think this is part of, again, getting back to the stillness diet, what we hope to sort of introduce is a way to balance that because you're right. I think it's something that we've just completely, um, the funny thing is, is we live these digital worlds. And then if you walk out, you walk out into the natural world and it lives by a completely different set of laws. Mm hmm the tree's yeah. not fast forwarding to when it gets leaves. It's not fast forwarding when it drops them. It, it is going with the set motions of the rhythm of the world around it. We are out of scope. <laughs> we are so out of scope. You know what I mean? With those rhythms. And I think COVID in, in some ways have, has helped this. And I think in the sense of like, because there's no commutes now, I am able to go to sleep when I'm tired and wake up when I'm done sleeping which is impossible when you have a job and need to have a button seat somewhere at a certain time, it's impossible. You have to get up way earlier than your body clock wants to. Right. Mm -hmm. So in some ways I think it's helped me get back into a circadian rhythm when it comes to sleep. Um, but in, uh, in other ways, and I think in every digital sense, if the laws, we, the laws that govern zoom and email and text 
are not natural laws. You know what I mean? They're just, they're, they abide by man. It's like the material world, right? But mm-hmm. it, the constant reminders are with us, with our children, with the natural world, where it's like, there is no point in clicking here. You can't look at a tree and get information about it. I know that that's where we're going as a society. Like, oh, well, I'll have these goofy glasses and I'll tell us that this is a ginkgo you're staring at and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, again, I feel like that gets us further off course. And I want it. I'm not, I don't think of technology as the enemy in any way, but I just wonder to myself, I'm like, how are we going to evolve spiritually to be able? I feel like digitally we've moved so fast that spiritually we went, we're sort of hanging it's very stagnant. It's not able to evolve to match the speed, right, of technology. Yeah, I know. I feel bad for ourselves. Our poor little frail human too. bodies are not prepared for this. But at the <laughs> same time, like maybe this is, you always bring this up to me, like this isn't new. He was writing, when, when was he writing meditations before mass? You know what I mean? Like the same things folks were struggling with then are the, you know what I mean? It isn't really all that different, probably not. But 1930s. Yeah. And here we think like, oh, that must be nice. Like no, barely any, you know what I mean? <laughs> like certainly no text messages, you know, maybe not even a car, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. I know. Do you want to talk about um, chapter three, silence and hearing? Yep. Let's do it. So here the, he, he um, challenges us not to read along when someone's reading something out loud, to let mm. it really sink in and hear the verbal expression, the auditory experience, let it, that be like resonant with us and to like really sink in and be attentive to the, the words. And, and I know people have, and I've done this too, where you're like, you want to read along because you don't want to miss a single thing, but in that action, you're dividing your attention from yes. hearing. I actually watched yeah. like a really hilarious reel on Instagram yesterday where um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy was like making fun of ma- uh, people who read at mass, you know, like the speed reader or the one that makes dramatic pauses or the <laughs> one that like has a really bad sound system. So you only hear like one or, every one other or two word. words. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm like, I totally need to do a reel about that too. Cause I, would I think like, that's yeah. that. I mean, come on, we all can relate. <laughs> <laughs> we all can relate the person that like consistently screws up no matter you know what I mean <laughs> like, every time someone comes up to read at mass I always just think like bless their heart because like bless this their is heart. not you know like they all of us are like not necessarily judging but we all have an opinion on what oh, yeah. we're hearing and like you know, some are better than others and it's like <laughs> well and especially when someone some poor person gets like the name of a town in Jerusalem that's like really hard to pronounce you know what I mean I'm like oh good luck with that one yeah yeah, there's always the people that have, yeah, like the people who aren't prepared at all, you know, they just kind of go up and they get the difficult words and that's never, <laughs> that's happened to me actually. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait. Yeah, because I was asked to do the readings at some CCW mass one time and I was like completely unprepared because it was like spur of the moment. Brilliant. And I was like, oh, great. I have no idea how to pronounce this correctly, but I can give it a go, right? Give it a go, give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> But I think too, what you're saying, like, I think it's like, we don't want to miss a word, but I also think we want to do something. I think truly think how hard it is when you go to a lecture to really listen. It's hard to give your full attention Mm -hmm. to something and to let that sink in. It's easier to like doodle or, you know, you should, you should have seen my church programs growing up. Like they just be covered with doodles, right? Because it's hard hard to sit there and listen to what someone is Thing. it's much easier to sort of like follow along just to keep your mind engaged right well I mean it, absolutely but he's just bringing it back to the, re- the reality that the word Jesus as the word the eternal word as he says I am the the word of God you know the word didn't come as something written in a book he was made flesh so Ooh, that we could see hear, like grasp with our hands so the, the word of God is meant to be heard, but to do that, you need to have the silence first. And it's true because we, you know, even in the atrium, like we're reading to these children, but we, we are proclaiming the word of God. And there's things that sound so much different when you say it out loud to someone than if you read it on the page. So he's, I'm, I totally am on board with a lot of what he's saying this chapter, because the poetry and the magic can kind of come out depending upon how it's read. Um, my friend who's like my, my teaching partner, she does such a good job of, spe- of her reading to small children. 
where they're just like hanging on her every word and it's like super adorable like she has just enough drama and just the right pace where it doesn't sound weird it just sounds intriguing and they're like what's she gonna say next yeah and it's like these words are illuminated by how they're said out loud yep and I think you know we all we've all had that one um, pastor or, you know, whoever is speaking that has done enough homework to be like, you know, this word in Greek means this, that is why what this person is saying is blah. You know what I mean? Like they're able to make the translation really come alive. And there's the benefit of, um, living today is we've got so much more knowledge and information about these texts and so many different and really fun interpretations. We've got the King James version and the, you know what I mean? And it's fun to play around with different versions of translations to see how the phrase how your interaction with it changes um so it's it's fun to your point to really let it hit you um there's a really there's a great book and it's it's um god was in this place and i did not know and it looks at a different biblical verse from like multiple interpretations and the text is so rich that it allows for that, right? It's kind of crazy and beautiful in many ways to sort of see, because you come away with it like, I never really thought of it like that. And then you have another interpretation and you're like, I never thought of it like that. Like there's just so, it's so varied. Um, and that's how powerful the word really word really is. And poetry is like this too, like this interpretation, this interpretation, that interpretation. And that's what's just fun about interacting with it. Cause you know, you are still you, but every time you go back and revisit it and hear it, hear it spoken, um, it comes to you in a different way. And I think that's the really cool thing about what he's saying about, again, that can connect you more closely sort of with spirit and what it's trying to portray to you. Absolutely. I mean, it's the living word for a reason. The living every word. time you interact with it, it's, there's a different richness and a different potential interpretation or a different part touches your heart or, you know, there's the Holy Spirit guiding a lot of that. But, you know, I wanted to mention this um, part on page 16, where he says, to have ears to hear requires grace. For God's word can be heard only by him whose ears God has opened. He does Mm. this when he pleases and the prayer for truth is directed at that divine pleasure. But it also requires something that we ourselves desire and are capable of being inwardly present, listening from the vital core of our being unfolding ourselves to that which comes from beyond to the sacred word i love that and all this is possible only when we are inwardly still yes so i think you know wrapping this one up um i think the point that i'm taking from these first few chapters is like the fundamental building block of all of this is stillness and to get comfortable with that and to embrace it because everything else you're you're layering all these different practices on top like the word interacting and hearing and listening none of those are possible without that foundation of stillness and i think that is for many people the most difficult piece to first establish right mm-hmm. for sure for sure all right well what chapters will so i think what do we get through stillness listening silence and hearing is chapter three so the next chapter is four composure Okay. I want to, I want to spend time with composure. I don't want to rush through it. Yeah, we could do the, there's two chapters on composure. There's composure and composure and actions. So do you want to do so let's two? do, yeah, let's do composure and composure and actions next week. And then I'll revisit those chapters and then we'll um, take our time with it. I don't want to rush through this. I think it's a really good book. We should sort of, you know, give it its due. Oh yes. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten some good book recommendations in my life but <laughs> this is really good. I know. I like it a lot. Um, all right. You have a lovely, lovely weekend. Thanks. You too. We'll talk Thank soon. You. I'll be back with another episode in one week. In the meantime, check out more content on olivebranchmom.com and follow me on Instagram at olivebranchmom. Check out my show notes for links to both. Thanks for listening.